Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us at this IEEE uh, presentation today. Uh, before we go ahead, I would like to uh, just go through this uh, our uh, upcoming conference. And uh, there are uh, uh, about 20 papers we already received. Uh, it's been changed the uh, submission submission date from June to uh, 15th of July. Um, this event is uh, uh, $400 for students, $600 for uh, the 650 for uh, IEEE members, and non-members uh, $100 uh, more. So um, can I just see who's IEEE members here? Put a hand up, please. Oh, yeah. So we have a few more um, uh, non-members here. So I highly encourage that we, this is actually third seminar that in this year we uh, we are having in the same venue and there are a few coming uh, upcoming events um, and this event is international event uh, it is uh, it's held in Perth uh, in your backyard so it's the, there are a few people coming from the US uh, UK Japan and around the world so I um, highly encourage you to uh, uh, think about it and uh, and join with that, uh, this conference uh, it's supposed to start 5.30, so I'm not going to take too long. I'm just going to give a bit of introduction to our uh, distinguished guest here, guest here, Professor Perelegi Mancarella, correct? enough? Perelegi Mancarella. He's a chair professor of electrical power system at the University of Melbourne, Australia, and part-time professor of Smart Energy Systems at the University of Manchester, UK. Um, he received his MSc and the PhD degrees from the uh, Politecnico uh, di Toronto, Italy. Um, he worked as a post, uh, postdoc at Imperial College London, UK and held several visiting positions in US, France, Chile and China. And his research interests uh, include multi-energy systems energy system uh, planning under un uncertainty and uh, reliability and the resilience of future networks. Um, he has been involved in and also led around 50 research projects worldwide and including leading the Melbourne Energy Institute's power system security assessment studies in support of the um, popular uh, Finkel review uh, of the future Australian energy market uh, scenarios. Uh, Professor Perugi is um, author of several books and over uh, 200 research publications. And he is also an editor in the IEEE Transactions uh, on Power Systems, IEEE Transaction on the Smart Grid, and IEEE Systems Journal. Um, the, uh, the first and immediate past chair of the energy working, uh, uh, he was also the person immediate uh, uh, past energy chair of the working group of the IEEE European Public uh, Policy Initiative and Power and Energy Society uh, Distinguished Lecture. Uh, Professor Perugi holds the 2017 Whiskey Innovation Fellowship by the Victorian Government and was recently awarded a prestigious international Newton Prize for his work on Power systems resilience, uh, resilience, and resilience in Chile. So that's our uh, uh, the the uh, invited guest here today. And please, uh, join me welcome Professor Pelagi. Thank you very much. It's always a bit embarrassing to hear the sort of uh, introductory notes. Uh, so. Let's do something a little bit more uh, fun. So what I'm going to uh, um, talk to you today is uh, primarily work that we did uh, uh, in the UK initially uh, to support uh, um, National Grid in the modeling of integrated electricity and gas networks, and then more work that we did on, on hydrogen, including several European projects, and uh, um, a little bit of the work that we are, we're doing and we're going to do most important in, in Australia on the same, same topic. So, I, I, I put a picture here of, of uh, I guess you know who this guy is, so, uh, dog, dog. So, why well, I put uh, <laughs> a dog here, because uh, we're really talking about, you know, 
no, what, what we're going to tell you is really about, about the future, but it's literally back to the future, the future that we lived probably 50 years ago already. Do you know what these two pictures are, what they represent? Oh. Which one? This one. Okay. Right. So, okay. So that's good. So Hubble telescope powered by PV and uh, Apollo 11, you know, moon landing fuel cell. So the very, very, the very technology that allowed man to. The moon landing is exactly what uh, we had retrieved. So it's really not talking about the future or again talking about the past. So this is the idea. Technology is there, is the message. So how come that we're talking about these things you know, now when they already existed 50 years ago? And that is the idea of uh, in understanding systems uh, uh, way beyond uh, uh, technology. And to give you a little bit of background uh, uh, of, of where this is all coming from, I put here the Senki diagram of the UK uh, en uh, energy system. It was really motivating much of this research. And if you look at the Senki diagram, this is primarily coming, you know, the inputs are all primarily, not, not all uh, fossil fuels. There is more and more wind and solar, but still negligible in terms of energy. And then there are here number of outputs. So we look at the outputs here. There are, of course, these strange colors. I mean, this, this, this is a fascinating case of, of this connection between government and engineers. Because this is the most important uh, picture of uh, uh, the UK, in fact, yeah, any country you, you think of this from the energy perspective. So there are lots of discussions going on about this picture, and there's no one in the UK or anywhere in the world able to actually name the colors of uh, this picture. So we need to agree on the names, because if I ask you, you will all say that this is called, in, how, how is this called? How do we call this color? So we're ready to, we're ready to, to, to opinions here, and I never heard this two in my life. So that's why I call it green. Okay. So how do we call this? It's called there's there's pink. And how do we call this? Right. Okay. So so you understand what I mean? No? Yeah. I, no. It would have been so much easier to say. Black, yellow, and blue. No, this, we have to sort of no, agree on something. Okay, so why are the colors so important? Because the colors indicate, in fact, the energy vector that uh, is being used for, for final usage. And in fact, one is electricity, the other one is heat, and the third one is transport. So, which one is uh, electricity of the three colors? Right. So, pink is electricity. What's so strange with the pink? So why do we care about electricity? Why do we care about decarbonization of electricity if effectively all the big problems are associated with gas for heating, this is heating, and transport? So when you look at energy, electricity is really tiny. So we, we are so worried about decarbonizing electric system when the big worry actually should be about decarbonization heat and transport. So look at this picture. One understands why there have been all these discussions still ongoing about electrification. Because say, okay, I know actually how to decarbonize electricity and even if it's tiny, let's put uh, um, more and more electricity into the other energy sectors so that I can actually understand potentially how to decarbonize also other, other, other energy, energy sectors. So electrification of heating, electrification of transport is basically coming from this kind of this kind of picture. And then there will be more things to say in there, including the fact that uh, very similar to what is done in Australia, you throw away all this heat and you, you use this heat to, to keep the fish at a very comfortable temperature in the sea and in, in, and in, in the river. Uh, you know, this is basically cooling, cooling, cooling water for uh, thermal power plants, where at the same time, you burn the gas to produce heat in boilers. So obviously there is a huge lack of efficiency when you look at system, system perspective. So be, 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 besides saying, well, let's look at electrification to help, given that we can decarbonize electricity, let's also look at integration of energy systems because we see huge inefficiencies already happening, uh, ha happening there. 
The problem is that this is very philosophical, it's, it's, it's very little to do with engineering, in the sense that uh, we, we are not putting the numbers yet. This is just uh, a theory. And uh, when, when we get to put the number on, on this, uh, it becomes quite uh, complicated because effectively, uh, this is really my, my, my like old work when I was in pre-art college time. How do you understand the implications of electrification of heating? So obviously, when you electrify heating, first thing you need to understand is uh, not so much the energy, but rather the peak. But what is the peak demand for heating? I mean, do you know what the peak demand? There is little heating in Australia, fine. But do, do you have any idea about the, the peak demand of heating? No. Yeah. Do you think that anyone knows in their countries how much peak demand of heating is? No, no one knows because you don't measure, you don't really measure heat. You, you, in the best, best cases, you measure gas and you, you measure gas sort of daily basis you know, and so on. So no one knows what heating is. So understand the, the, how complicated it is. You, know, you want to elect, electrify an energy, a, a new, another energy sector, but you don't even know how big this energy sector is. You only understand, roughly speaking, energy-wise, but you know, it's very little use if you need to build a new infrastructure for energy sectors. So that's why I'm saying it's very philosophical discussion. If you don't put numbers, you can't really do anything. You can't have a vision really without numbers because you can be completely off. So <coughs> the work that we did 10 years ago was to build a model of the heating system of the UK to have an idea of what the peak consumption is. What do we expect that the peak, cons peak consumption of heating is with respect to electricity? Here you see the energy levels. What do you think about, uh, about the, the peak? Particular units? Or? In, in relative terms. Because if you have no idea, the, what you're going to see is pretty shocking. N times. This is the magnitude of the problem. This is doing the engineering and not the philosophy. Blue is electricity. Red is, is heat. So when you look at this, yeah, I know everyone, everyone in this face, including us, when we built, you know, when I built you know, this, you know, it was like, okay, what's going on here? It's probably wrong. And now after 10 years, we know that this is not wrong. So, what happens here is that effectively the peak demand is around 55 gigawatts and the estimated, of course it's a model, the estimated peak demand is around for heating is 250 to 300 gigawatts. So when you electrify this, when it's really cold in the UK, you would like to use various types of heat pumps, no matter how good these heat pumps are, still, even if you divide the heat peak by, say, coefficient of three or four, which is the coefficient of performance of heat pump, and a, a fantastic heat pump that actually doesn't exist when it's really cold, well, you will go down probably to, say, between 50 and 100 gigawatt additional of electrified heating. So you say, currently I have 55, I need at least to double my electricity system. And, and of course, no, this, is, this is completely unrealistic. But this is the magnitude of the problem. Do you want to decarbonize the energy sector? Okay, you need to deal with heating. This is all coming from gas now. How do you do in, in, in the future? Electrification is really, really impractical because you know, basically we need to build another electricity system on top of that. And as you can see also, sorry, the utilization of this uh, would be very low because obviously you, is, you use lots, very, very little heating even in, in, in the UK in, in summer. Uh, and a lot in winter. So also the, the, the seasonal peakiness of, of, of this would make the investment very inefficient in terms of infrastructure. So the idea of integrating really was coming from, from this kind of, of, of thinking. On one hand, uh, say you want to electrify, but electrify is crazy, and then say, can we do something, something different? Look, and then National Grid basically came and said, okay, we would like to understand better how electricity and gas are interacting because we know that in the future something would be done, would be completely different, but for sure we know that uh, given that heating is, is based on gas and in the future there will be more and more such uh, technologies that can do different things, we know that the flow in the gas networks will change, 
but at the same time also the flow in the electrical nature would, would change because either you electrify or you change things anyway. At the same time, you would keep, still keep using most probably lots of gas turbines for balancing uh, either renewables or, or the other things. So again, there would be different interactions going on to a gas network. And finally, because for regulatory reasons, uh, electricity and gas, uh, they cannot talk to each other, the best thing to do is to give this, the job to, to universities and try to see you know, a sort of independent view of, uh, of, of the interaction. So we developed the tools during, uh, what was like six, six or seven years ago, by looking, uh, you know, we, we measure a grid by uh, looking at simplified transmission uh, models for the electricity and the gas networks, and try to basically develop a number of use cases that could become critical in, in the future for, for the two systems. So the first thing that we looked at is the impact of renewables on gas generators. And this is just, just an example showing, even with little penetration of wind, how, and these are real numbers, how already, depending on how much wind you have in the system, you would completely change the profile of the gas turbines. And there is a perfect correlation between lack of wind and use of uh, gas, uh, uh, gas turbines. What is the impact in terms of energy? This is, uh, um, this is, this is a model that we built uh, to simplify, uh, not to, to, so to summarize the situation, but in a simple way. So imagine that uh, this is the utilization of uh, the UK fleet. So there are about uh, under 50 major power plants in the UK. And this is the utilization level. So it goes from the, from the base load power plants with uh, um, utilization level of about 85%, this is already including um, maintenance and all that, to the peak in power plants that uh, are, uh, got a utilization level, you know, that is even, even lower than, than 10%. Now, when you introduce wind, in this case, 30 gigawatts of wind, the UK has got a peak demand of 55 gigawatts. So when you introduce about 50% of the peak demand in capacity of, of wind, the energy utilization level goes down substantially uh, because basically wind displaces in the market the, the energy produced by, um, by, by, by gas generators. Gas generators and generators, of course. When you zoom out uh, the, uh, what, what happens for the peakers, you will see that most uh, of our plants that uh, were already producing between 40% and close to 0%, now actually, we we'll produce between 10% and 0%. So effectively, the peakers are affected very, very substantially. So when you look at uh, the impact uh, on the economics of these power plants, uh, if you look at the whole system, say this is the, the cost of producing, say, one kilowatt hour, including the recovery of the fixed cost, and this is the utilization level. So obviously, the more, the more electricity you can produce, you know, the less your cost is because you are able to spread your investment over, over a larger share of production. So if you look at the average, this is like sort of 50%. With more and more wind, this is a conventional power plants, primarily gas. With more and more wind, the average will go down. This was the picture we saw already. So when we say we are not too worried about the impact on the cost of electricity, if actually look at this picture, they say, well, I, I move from here with this uh, specific cost uh, to here, and the cost is very similar. So on average, you think the impact on the conventional generator is not so substantial. However, unfortunately, it doesn't work. I mean, the, the market doesn't work with the averages. You know, it works plant by plant. So when you look at the peakers, the peakers will be in this region, and this is the cost of the peakers today. Then you add uh, wind, and because you decrease a little bit your utilization level, their specific cost goes up there. Now, what, this is the cost. At the same time, you have a market where your ability to recover investment is actually going down because uh, there are renewables and all that. So actually, the market has changed completely. And, and in most cases, actually, you see energy, energy prices that are lower than before, and then you will need to look into other markets, basically, to recover investment. And, and again, that's why we started discussing the UK capacity mechanisms and all that, because otherwise uh, there would be no other ways for these speakers effectively to stay, uh, to stay in the game. And I guess this is something very familiar with what happened in Australia, particularly South Australia, with more and more wind and solar into system pushing out conventional generators. So this is, this is you know, things uh, that, that you know, is sort of expected, uh, 
but unfortunately, you know, then happen also in the real world. These are sort of slides that are 10 years, 10 years old now. So, and this is not from a sort of fundamental perspective, but what happens dynamically? Well, let's look at uh, uh, the future, for example, in this scenario. Again, 47, this is, this is really a crazy scenario. You know? it, it's crazy because, not, not so much because of the 47 gigawatt wind, but because of the 15, 15 gigawatt of solar. I mean, who would put 15 gigawatt of solar in the UK? I mean, there is no sun. I mean, you know, so this is absolute nonsense. But anyway, it's the, it would be impressed by how much uh, g PV generation there is. So let's assume that this scenario is, is anyway realistic. These are, again, the, the sort of test scenarios National Grid uses. And this is what happens to wind with, with these conditions. You know, you have basically, you start having peaks of production in the order of 35 gigawatt for a 55 gigawatt peak with an installed capacity of 47. But mostly interesting, look at the ramps up and down of wind. I mean, if before already we were seeing that with a small penetration level of wind, already this was impacting a lot on the balancing plants. Look at this, you know, ramp down uh, in, in around the beginning of December. And these are all based on, on sort of historical data that have been scaled up to, uh, to, new, to new penetration level. Look at this massive um, ramp down between 30 and, uh, and 5 gigawatts. So if we again become a little bit more specific. This is what happens. So you have this massive change in the wind profile of a, of a couple of days. But it's not only about variability. It's also about uh, unpredictability. Because this is what you see as a variation. But the question is, are you able to predict this or not? Because if you are able to predict, say, okay, it's not too bad. Eventually, I can ramp up and down my power plants. But how, how much are you able to predict this? Because if you are not able to predict this, then you really start running into big issues. And in fact, what happens is that if you, if you use the sort of current tools that will be used for, for, for prediction, uh, say that the blue is the predictive one, and the actual generation is uh, uh, the, the actual generation, or this expected generation, of the combined cycle gas turbines that will be used to balance this would actually be the green ones. So as you can see, there are areas where you have massive difference. So at this point, see that you have a difference in what you, you would expect to, to be the generation and the actual generation that is needed in the order of five, five gigawatts. So five gigawatts of CCGT just going up and down unexpectedly to, to, deal, to deal with wind. Now, let's look at the gas network. When you have this kind of things, Obviously, the ability of the gas network to provide uh, a flexibility to CCGT to do that is limited because it comes from the amount of storage is embedded in the, in the, in the line pack. So the, the amount of storage is really available uh, in, uh, in, in the pipelines to, to balance uh, intraday oscillations. And there is some storage, of course, but for things that happen during the day, you really need to rely on what, 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 what is available in, in the gas network. So there are cases, actually, where you can reach a minimum level of, uh, um, of line pack, which effectively means because you, are, you, are not, uh, you were not able to predict uh, that the gas generators would operate in a certain way, and you operate them much more than expected, the pressure goes down. So the pressure in the gas goes down dramatically, and it can become worrying at, at, at some point, you know, sort of minimum pressure that you don't want to, to have, because if you sort of black out the gas network, it's not really easy to understand what, what, what happens to, to start it again. So this is for renewables. Now, when you start introducing also modeling for heating, now what, what happens? So this is the model that we built some time ago um, for, the, for, the, for the UK energy system, where basically we mapped, uh, we, we built the heating model, this, this is the aggregate uh, results, we, we built the heat, the heat model for a number of regions. Let's say we try to assess the impact again on the gas and uh, electricity system. This is a bottom-up uh, um, model, and as I said, uh, the, the main reason to do this was because about 40% of the emissions come from the heating sector. So understanding heating was really really key for for future for future scenarios. So we built we built this model. It was pretty pretty sophisticated. You know, it, it took years of work to actually. Do, uh, do all of this, which uh, can come down to do this kind of modeling for, for, for Manchester. So this is actually work that we're still doing now with National Grid, how you can map 
the, the future heated scenarios and the impact on the gas and the electricity sector down to individual substations. So we're doing this mapping down to the 33 kV substations. Uh, so basically, by postcode by postcode, we are able to assess uh, what the heating is, what the heat profile will be, and what will happen in future scenarios as impact uh, locally to, um, for example, this is again Manchester, but also at, uh, at the system level. Now, very interesting thing, you know, this, this is the modeling to sort of generalized uh, optimal power flows that look not only at electricity, but also look at how heat is interacting with, with electricity, of course, and then there is a gas uh, um, power flow analysis running on top of the electricity power flow. So what is very interesting to find is that, for example, when you, when you analyze gas scenarios and uh, electricity, uh, electrified scenarios with electric heat pumps, the impact on the gas generators, so the, the combined cycle gas turbines particular, is very, very substantial. And it, it, it's particularly interesting in terms of the ramps that the generators need to, uh, to, to undergo. Because effectively, in a gas-based heating system, these are the three hours ramp that uh, you will have for, um, for, for, for combined cycles. The three hours is also coming from the idea of saying, if you are able to predict, you can also commit uh, combined cycles to, um, to, to, to sort of balance the, 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 the system. Whereas when you electrify heating, the ramp, so the three hours ramp, becomes very, very substantial. So before we saw that the combined cycles would be in great stress uh, to follow uh, wind. Now we see combined cycles might be in great stress to follow uh, electric, uh, heating as well due to, uh, due to electrification. So obviously this is all bringing a picture where the gas network and what you do with the gas network is more and more uh, important to the point that in the model that we developed for them, we proposed basically that there was a need in the future to introduce uh, operational constraints in the electricity optimal power flow to actually take into account the gas network constraints. So in other, in other, in other words, because the, the ramping of the, uh, the, the power plants would not be limited by the classical constraints that we see in electricity systems, but rather by constraints introduced by the gas network. So the inability of the gas network to pump sufficient gas into the system at times so that uh, the combined cycle could, could undergo these, these ramps. Therefore, the only, the only solution, there would be other solutions, but a possible solution would be to constrain the ramps of the combined cycle based on interaction of the gas network. Otherwise, well, you have to do other things, but uh, it, it, would not, it would not work. So clearly, showing that the two systems need to be operated in an integrated way and the more you change, uh, uh, you more, you, the more you go towards the future with new technologies uh, and more in, in interactions between technologies, the more you also need to operate the systems and the market in a more uh, integrated, uh, uh, integrated way. Um, but then say we still have uh, the problem of what you do with, uh, with, with the curtailment of renewables, that in the future will become, will become massive. So, so far we, we say that the, the, all, all these ideas of uh, uh, electrifying and uh, um, having new, um, heavy, heavy new technologies for um, decarbonization heating and all that was introducing challenge, uh, uh, challenges, and this is true. At the same time, we see that uh, we still uh, have periods of time with massive curtailment because, again, when you look at uh, a future where wind can be 30, 40 um, uh, gigawatts uh, and, and you have all the operational constraints, including stability constraints, you know, that in the system, there will be times where you may, you may have uh, to curtail massive amounts of wind. And, and some of this curtailment is really coming from the fact that if you want to balance this system and you, you, you want to make sure that if there is a, a, a sudden drop or increase in, in, uh, in wind, you have power plants that are able to follow this. So the, the, the requirement for balancing, introducing basically requirements for spinning reserves, and again, because you have spinning reserves, you also have to curtail wind. So there is, there is sort of quite complex uh, um, playing there. So eventually, so what do you do? Can you, can you do something with this curtailment? Can you, can you, can you change it into something, something useful? And yes, and finally we say, well, so far we have blamed the gas network for being 
quite, uh, uh, quite, quite uh, sort of un unhelpful in a way, but maybe we can now do something useful. And that was, that's, that's when I you know, started discussing the idea of taking cartel wind, turn it into a hydrogen, and uh, inject into, into the gas network. So basically, say, if we in the future go more and more for very high penetration renewables, there will be times where inevitably you have huge curtailment. And even if you put batteries in other things, batteries can store, at least currently, can store well power, but not energy, really. You know, here we're talking about massive amounts of energy. I invite you to make calculation how, ma how many Tesla batteries you would need in the UK to, to store this energy that would be curtailed, while at the same time, the heating you know, is not being met, transport is not being met, and so on. So there is something you would like to do with this, and again, as a form of storage. So can you use as a form of storage uh, the, the, basically the, the shifting from electricity into other energy sectors and possibly use, uh, for example, the gas networks as a form of storage? So this power to gas effectively corresponds to say, I take otherwise curtailed electricity, I turn it into hydrogen, I inject it, into, uh, into the gas network, and in case, I can also do methanation, so I, I, I take hydrogen, I make it react uh, um, with, uh, uh, with, with, with CO2, and uh, I create methane, and I inject in the gas network directly methane. Why would you, would you do this next step? Because there is a limit uh, of how much uh, hydrogen you can inject into the gas network, I think in Australia it's 10%, 10% in volume. Uh, this, this limits, there, there is a technical limit in the order of 20%, but then most countries, the, the limit is really regu regulatory. Uh, and this changes country by, by country. Um, physically, it's related to the fact that hydrogen um, is, is very volatile, you know, it's sort of the tiniest element uh, on, on Earth, therefore it doesn't go very well with uh, um, steel pipelines and all that. There's also a problem with uh, uh, combustors at the end of, uh, of, 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 of the chain. So say up to 20% seems feasible, but these are numbers that you know, can be debated, but you know, these are order of magnitude. Uh, and uh, so you know you are limited to uh, how much hydrogen you can inject into gas natural. So if you really have lots, potential idea is uh, you 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 do a further reaction. Uh, you really you really use methane, create methane, and you inject directly methane. This is methane that will be coming from hydrogen produced from electrolysis, so completely clean, and CO2. So CO2 would be some, something that would be somehow recycled. So instead of uh, sort of emitting into, into, into the atmosphere CO2, you recycle it with, uh, with, with hydrogen and you inject it into, um, into the system. You know, these are some sort of technical, technical thing. Okay, so what is that we can do uh, you know, once we, we, we think about this, this interaction? So we, we, we were analyzing a number of use cases, you know, looking at uh, the UK system. So a typical one is we have lots, lots, lots of wind in Scotland, and we have lots of demand in, uh, in, in, in the area of London, Birmingham, and so on. Because of a number of reasons, you can't really bring down wind from Scotland because these interconnectors is relatively weak, and uh, you know, putting new interconnectors you know, takes decades and all that. So once you have uh, this constraint here, and you have a gas terminal there, can you take the wind, the wind that is there, redirect it into a gas terminal as uh, basically hydrogen, and then basically use the gas network to bring down a form of energy. So you don't bring down wind as such, and instead of curtailing, you turn it into, you turn it into hydrogen, or methane in case, you inject it to gas network, and so you somehow decarbonize the energy system by, by, by doing this, this transformation. When you look at the numbers, basically this is the amount, uh, this is really the profile that will be coming out of this operation. It's, it's clearly, this is really mapping wind curtailment into generation of hydrogen and methane in case of injection to gas network. And then of course it will come with cost benefits and carbon reduction because obviously there are cost benefits because you avoid, uh, I mean this is gas that you displace basically in, in, the, in, in the network. And same for carbon reduction, though they are more complex ways of really making this, uh, this assessment. Similarly, if you, areas, if you have areas of the system that are constrained for, constrained, for example, because of the low pressure, 
can you use injection of hydrogen to actually raise the pressure? So again, you do this shifting between electricity and gas to help the gas system. So uh, the gas system is, in this case, a form of flexibility for the electricity system. So instead of using batteries and, and storage and all that, you use this energy shifting to provide this flexibility. And at the same time, you are, um, you are decarbonizing anyway the gas, uh, the, the, the gas system when you, uh, when you do that. And then uh, at the very end, uh, there is this idea of doing seasonal storage. So say, because this curtailment happens primarily during summer when demand is not very high and still there is lots of wind, and then there is lots of gas needed uh, in, in, in winter. So can you actually take the gas uh, that you are producing, store it, and then reuse it in winter? So this form of seasonal storage is really what is missing the big picture of decarbonization pretty much everywhere, because if batteries and other things uh, are good for, for very sort of fast storage and short-term short storage, this seasonal storage is, is something that is still on, on, on the plate in terms of understanding what to do. So this could be a, a potential application. Of course, this, uh, the analysis that we did was primarily technical and, and techno-economic. When you looked at uh, the way that you were analyzing system operation, to do really the full cost-benefit analysis also, including investment of that, this is you know, another exercise uh, that will come on, 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 on top of that. Now, how about transport? Don't, let's not forget that there is a massive uh, energy here that is uh, uh, required by, by transport. So, idea could be, again, you can't, instead of electrifying everything, you, you use some uh, hydrogen, for example, to, um, to, 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 to supply, for example, demand uh, for buses, trucks, uh, um, you know, heavy trucks, uh, trains, and all this. So all, all again, those applications where batteries are not, being, are not really suitable because you, will, you need huge batteries to do that. So we've been involved in this very big project on, on, in, in Europe. It's 70 million euros project on um, uh, hydrogen vehicles. That's, that's the largest project in Europe so far. And uh, we were looking at uh, uh, how basically by how you could use, uh, again, hydrogen to decarbonize parts of transport, especially heavy, 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 heavy transport. But we're doing something a little bit more interesting than just assessing sort of energy balancing. We look at uh, if we could use electrolyzers to provide uh, fast frequency response, so that basically you could use the electrolyzers instead of batteries to provide very fast reserves in low inertia systems. And we did the studies for the UK, for Germany, and for, for France. To say, okay, I decarbonize transport. I have these uh, uh, very large refueling stations where you have electrolyzers. There are massive loads. Can I use these massive loads to provide system security? These are some results from the UK looking basically at uh, how much primary frequency response you could displace if you could uh, use uh, um, hydrogen refueling stations instead of, for example, gas turbines to provide uh, um, primary frequency response. And then, of course, it's not only primary frequency response through fast frequency response, but it's also secondary reserve and, to some extent, tertiary reserve. So, effectively, you could use these very flexible loads to displace large parts of, of, of the reserves. And then, what is really interesting is that you can clearly identify in the modeling how batteries and electrolyzers can interact and complement each other. For example, what you will find is, when you look at the allocation of high frequency and low frequency response, uh, this is these two pictures here. So this is for frequency response, uh, for frequency drop. So this is low frequency response. This is a high frequency response. So you will see that naturally, you would do the low frequency response, so this is a raised service, with electrolyzers, and then you would do the high frequency um, response, so the lower services, with batteries. So you don't use batteries for primarily. You don't use batteries for everything as it is done now will be done. Because once you have a huge load in the system that can be disconnected in a super flexible way, you know, why would you use a battery whose job is to arbitrage and do other, say, other things when you can use a load whose job is to actually produce hydrogen and then sometimes when you have a big contingency, you just disconnect it and basically you do it at zero, close to zero marginal cost. So you have massive, massive benefits 
from, uh, from, from doing this. And additionally to that, you can also use this, uh, this, this electrolyzer for more general balancing purposes. For example, put here like distributed system with the typical sort of test case, uh, um, medium voltage networks. And imagine that now connected to that, uh, there are a number of hydrogen refueling stations. So okay, what is the map of, of this network? This is an example of what we were discussing earlier in terms of flexibility map. So if I look at this, uh, this sort of piece of, piece of network, as it may be seen from the transmission network, this effectively can be mapped uh, as a, a PQ, uh, PQ curve, P PQ area, where from uh, I am operating this, uh, in this region, but potentially I can use resources to move from, from, this, from this position to other positions and ideally provide balancing services to a transmission system. So when you start introducing, and this is also the, the zoomed out map, when you introduce hydrogen, suddenly you see that the amount, the scale of uh, what uh, hydrogen could, could do, especially looking at so, so some form of de decarbonization transfer, is massive. So you could massively change the operating area, which corresponds to, 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 to saying, I have now huge flexibility that is also available in the distribution network, and can I use this flexibility in an optimal way, in addition to, provi to providing frequency services and so on. But let me, let me try to, to be a bit more explicit coming back to Australia. So this is the, the port Lincoln area. This is the end of the national energy market. This is really the tip of, uh, of, of the NAM. It's a highly congested area in the Kaltana substation, and it's, it's an area super rich in wind and, 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 and solar. So the problem is that there are lots of connection inquiries about wind and solar, but uh, because it is congested, there's not really much to do. But it's also a port uh, with possibility of export and so on. So there's not been a project under development with which we've been involved, looking at the idea of saying we use uh, uh, wind and solar that, again, instead of, being, instead of curtailing it, we produce hydrogen that could be used for local purposes or in case for export, as hydrogen is ammonia. In addition to that, there is a, an open cycle gas turbines that runs on hydrogen that has been uh, brought here from, um, from Italy to actually demonstrate uh, the, the ability of hydrogen-based turbines to provide number of services. So what we did was we developed this, 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 this tool basically looking at, at the Port Lincoln cases multi-commodity hub where you will have the renewables, you have uh, conventional generators in there, you have hydrogen generators, power to gas technologies for different purposes, fuel storage for, for hydrogen, there are some batteries there because there are lots of, uh, uh, there's lots of wind and solar there. Then all of this, you know, they will have conventional markets look, looking at electricity exports, of course. There is local demand. There is fuel export uh, if, you, if you can export hydrogen. But what we looked at is, what is the ability of this hub to actually provide frequency control and ancillary services, system restart and ancillary services, this is the end of the name, and fast frequency response. What is this fast frequency response, uh, more, more specifically? This is not the, the, just the generic definition that we gave of very fast response. It is actually a connection requirement of uh, the Office of Tech and Regulator in South Australia that uh, if you are a generator and you want to connect, you basically must, you must have a frequency response that is comparable to that of a synchronous generator. So there are two ways of doing it. One is uh, you are a synchronous generator. The second is, uh, typically, you put a battery. And there is a very specific requirement, basically saying, if you want to connect, if there is a frequency change, you must be able to provide 49% of your power output in terms of frequency response. So effectively, sort of inject 49% of your power output uh, within uh, about half a second. That is the sort of requirement. Uh, of, of, of the tech regulator. So we, what we assessed, you analyze here is, instead of putting a battery, if you already have hydrogen there, can you use, this, can you disconnect the hydrogen, uh, elec the, the electrolyzer, to provide this fast frequency response and basically comply with the, with, with the requirements? 
Obviously, this requires a change in the way that you would operate your, your, your plant. And then if you, if you look at the way you would operate the plants and the revenues, you can now access multiple, multiple um, revenue streams. So you can do, you can do FCAS, various FCAS, raise and, and lower. Of course, you, know, you can buy or sell hydrogen, buy or sell because also you have hydrogen turbine there, so you have also some storage. But also, uh, you can produce, of course, hydrogen, which would be, would be paid for. But then you can also intertrip your hydrogen production with, for example, the um, PV, um, P PV farms, so that any time that basically EPV is producing a certain amount, you would generate 49% of that production, so that if there is a problem, you disconnect the, uh, the electrolyzer, and then you comply with the fast frequency response requirement of the PV. So we're analyzing all this, and what happens that is really interesting, how you can build a business case that is completely different to, to your traditional business case, having electricity and hydrogen. This is now, you know, you don't do electricity and hydrogen, you now system security, we basically any electrolysis is completely different um, proposition um, there, and very similar things you could do it in the future, looking at uh, um, provisional resilience. So this is again something we discussed earlier. This is the, the the toy picture of the system separation event uh, in 25th of August, when there was a, um, a trip here on the interconnector from Queensland to the rest of the system. Trip and interconnector cause high frequency response here, low frequency response in the rest of the system. Tasmania was also tripping, or close to tripping, but it didn't happen. At a certain point, South Australia responded with a very fast uh, injection in the main system where the frequency was going down. Guess who was providing this very fast response? Tesla, Tesla battery. So Tesla battery provided this very fast response, too fast. Because uh, a very fast response provided by a Tesla battery over the interconnector make uh, the protection of uh, uh, able to think that uh, the system was undergoing a uh, rotor rango instability. So the interconnector tripped because the, the, the Tesla battery basically injected power so fast uh, into Victoria that uh, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, the, the angles look, look, looked as if the angles of the two systems were coming like this very, very fast. Obviously, the interconnector did not know that now there is a very fast sort of DC energy that can be, uh, can be put into the system. It's not only, you know, the rules of angles and, and the AC system. So there were issues like this. It's a bit more complicated than that. But, you know, bottom, bottom line, this is, this is what happened. So the idea is, instead of having you know, all of this relying on conventional technologies and new technologies and so on. Could you use in the future, again, this massive uh, uh, flexible loads that you could have electrolyzer to provide some support? So here we analyzed, uh, for example, how different levels of electrolyzers in Victoria could have actually helped uh, the system and could have changed uh, the profile of the system response. This is our modeling of the event, which is close enough to be, to be realistic. And in particular, you can see that the moment that you have uh, you had uh, an electrolyzer response in Victoria, actually the frequency in South Australia would have been completely different. So because of the frequency response, uh, because the frequency profile would be different, also the frequency response of um, the battery could have been different. So probably there would have been, uh, you know, the, 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 you would not have had uh, any heavy trip. Now, this is of course lots of speculation. I, I will get. I will get it. This, of course, lots of speculation. The idea is really try to say, if you have in the future this integrated system, can you use it in a very smart way to provide, uh, uh, you know, a number a number of services, including um, security services. So now you understand that we are really going back to the future. We say we integrate renewables, we integrate hydrogen, we integrate electricity, gas. Uh, uh, in, in all this, uh, and we need to do it in an environment that is very different from the UK environment. So this is the Australian environment, uh, and I put here, mm. what future for Australia as an energy superpower, where now the superpower is coming from the fact that we export uh, lots of coal and lots of uranium. So there is this uh, grand plan of saying, you know, this is, this is 
uh, Ross Garneau, Alan Finkel, you know, all these great, great thinkers saying, is the future about uh, exporting renewables as hydrogen, as ammonia? Maybe, maybe that is the direction. So what we're doing is uh, um, currently in the future fuel CRC to basically analyzing the infrastructure requirements and system operation of a, of a tightly interconnected electricity gas hydrogen system. So we're not building the tools uh, of the likes that, that we use in the UK for Australia to show actually what this means for systems, like the whole Australia and spe specific states, you know that, and then also the level of cities, if you look more for sort of electrify, but also part of hydrogen in cities, what does it mean in terms of uh, um, infrastructure? And this, uh, I think I'm, I'm done some references. The, the acknowledgements for you know, my research teams in, in Melbourne and, 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 and in Manchester. There, there was a question over there, I just want to say that if, if, you, if you want to criticize this work, I think you can blame my researchers. If you want, if you want to praise it, I take all the credit. I'm very happy to, to do that. No, I mean, they're, they're amazing, amazing people, apart, apart from jokes. Of course, uh, this would not be possible without some research funding from various, various partners. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I hope that it was, was of interest. Thank you. Sorry, now there is a question. Sorry. That <laughs> My question was, um, the modeling you did assumed that the electrolyzers are on, they're working, and you can turn them off very quickly for the fact that the people's response. But in the reality of the world, we, they're not, they won't be on all the time because they'll be generating hydrogen until the vessel is full and they'll be off. Did you do any modeling to say, well, what if they're not available or any half yeah. of them available? Yeah. Or? That, um, the, we, we are where we are not, not in that specific case, but we are doing it. Because the, the idea is uh, there would be, if you really look at uh, an integrated system, you would also have to look into co-optimizing the operation, possibly taking into account the fact that this electrolyzer will be there also to provide system security. So the way that we look at, at this in the future is uh, um, not just uh, if, if they are there, they provide it or not, uh, you leave it a little bit random. No, it's like they really become market participants in the provision of frequency frequency control. So you would know exactly when they are there, because effectively they are in the market. So you will be aware somehow uh, that they are there and uh, uh, they could provide support or, or not. So, so the challenge though is that's the same issue that Coffee Power Station today was spinning reserve. You're effectively setting aside a generation source or a load source mm -hmm. that's dedicated to that function and yes you get hydrogen from the other end. Yeah. But there's a limitation because the hydrogen has to go somewhere and so if it's not being consumed, yeah. there will be a physical limitation. So mm -hmm. there, it's still, I suppose I saw you were sort of saying that's a better alternative for batteries and I go, I get that a battery has limitations, but it's also a dedicated asset. So they're, mm -hmm. they're both at the same challenges in the sense that yeah. we're relying on a dedicated asset to solve that problem. Yeah. And so we hope there's some side benefits. Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely, there, there, is a key, there is a key difference that the battery's job um, is uh, to sort of arbitrage. The hydrogen job, the electrolyzer job is to produce hydrogen. Mm. So if actually you can rely on a load to provide uh, uh, raised services, because the load will be there anyway, then it's better to use the load rather than use another asset that has got uh, the option to say I uh, provide one service or the other service. So one of the slides I, I showed earlier is showing exactly that. The moment you can, you can rely on different portfolios, uh, you should use the batteries uh, rather to provide uh, uh, lower services and uh, the, uh, the, the electrolytes to provide uh, raised services. Exactly because on average, even if you don't optimize it, you have load there to be co disconnected you know, very, very fast. Now this is all sort of, at, at the moment, uh, it, it's still um, uh, sort of just to demonstrate the concepts. We are really now developing the series tools, and then we will see actually how to do all this. And then, of course, the market will have to be informed so by this kind of things. On that basis, have you done the financial modeling behind these scenarios? So we are we are developing the so the financial modeling is is something for this kind of system incredibly complicated because uh, is it the system model or is this sort of financial model of, of an asset? that you're thinking of. Because you can do the financial model of, of an asset, and we are doing it. So the Paul Link, we have a very sophisticated sort of tool to build a, 
to assess the, the business case, uh, for example, the likes of Paul Lincoln, where you basically have a, 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 an asset uh, or a portfolio that uh, looks at electricity, hydrogen, energy, renewables, batteries, uh, um, and, and the provision of multiple services to the market. So we have a tool to do that. So we say, can you do this uh, today and assess the business case uh, today? Yes, uh, we can do. But no, to do that in five years, you need to understand what, what is the system in five years, what are the prices in five years for electricity, hydrogen, and FCAS and all that. That's so that's really the, the complicated thing. Well, that's the point, is that you know, some of those complications, particularly with networks that can't be happening yeah. today, you know, they're not happening in five years' time. Yeah, yeah. So the financial modeling, the business cases, typically when you're going to govern on infrastructure, mm -hmm. you need to ultimately stack. So yeah. it's ultimately it's the end consumer that's paying for the consumption. Yeah. Um, so whilst the, the modeling is absolutely relevant, yeah. the tandem, so is the business case and scenario cost for that energy consumption yeah. and production. So the answer is anyway, we have the model to do that. So but what, what I'm saying is, I'm just sort of, I'm just arguing the complexity. If you ask me, you have the model to do this, the answer is yes. So, but then, you know, it, it's a lot more complicated than what people would, would, just, would just think. Okay, well, yeah. One of the challenges that AMO is struggling with at the moment is that, that issue of the frequency response market is yeah. quite lucrative, but batteries as an example could potentially Simplify that, and the value of that market drops to yeah, the point where mm -hmm. the value of hydrogen is going to be worth more than the FGAS market for electrolyzer. Otherwise, it doesn't stack up. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I mean, you clearly see this in the results. And, I mean, this is actually what we are discussing. I mean, I'm here primarily to discuss uh, uh, frequency, frequency control markets, or future frequency control markets. So I thought it would be interesting to to highlight this because obviously you have now complete new assets with huge potential. In, in the future, and the value of, of that uh, would, uh, uh, would, would sort of well, would influence and be influenced at the same time by, by a number of markets, including hydrogen, what's happened to energy, renewables, and, and, and all that. So, yeah. here, Luigi, pardon me, um, how, what's the next step moving forward now that the modeling is done and building on the business case? Yeah. Uh, where, where do you see this transitioning? So, the, we're, we're really, uh, so the, the modeling, I mean, we are, we, are, we are developing the model, you know, it's not, it's not all there. We really want to do this uh, for, for sort of the gas and electricity industry. So first, first one thing we're doing is the modeling, the, the sort of, the, well, it's too far anyway, the integrated system model that we have uh, for, the, for the networks. Let me go back. Yeah, so this kind of thing. So we would like to build a tool that we can give, for example, within the future fuel CRC, a tool that we can just give to the gas industry to start having some ideas of what. Because at the moment, uh, there is no tool that says, okay, but this is the electricity system, this is the gas system, I put hydrogen, but I don't really understand what, what, what this means. So as part of the work we will do is we will, give, we will develop a tool we give for free to gas industry to understand better this kind of, this, this, this kind of things. And I think when we create uh, more awareness uh, with all the market participants about the implication of that, uh, then the idea would be to inform uh, really uh, you know, the developments. You know, it can be markets you know, for electricity, can be markets for electricity, hydrogen and gas. Um, system plan, obviously this means uh, part of the modeling is uh, how do you develop a system, uh, a sort of a planning tool for electricity and gas uh, Look at, at, at hydrogen there. So, so these are things on the, on the development. As, as you can appreciate, the, the gas price per kilowatt hour here is only way to relatively cheap. So there's mm -hmm. some application for it, um, possibly over the years to But as, as, the regu as a lot of these market operators like um, AGIG and Atco are going for market regulator, uh, their capex and their opex is obviously coming down significantly. They're based in and around the consumption by the market. So the market itself is consuming a lot less gas based in and around the greater deployment of dirt. So how do you see that integrating in the modern moving forward? Yeah. So the, the technically, the model is capable to do that. What uh, the reason why we are so actually glad to work in this project is that industry, I mean, like yourself, for example, you know, say, you know, you, you, this is a consideration that, that you made. So, okay, okay, how do you, what, what does this mean if you look really at the integrated operation? 
where we would put, give this sort of information to the model, and then the model hopefully would be able to inform more consistently you know, uh, what, what, what can happen in terms, of, in terms of system. So we are really trying to develop a tool that realistically can capture all this interaction, and then based on various scenarios, various sensitivities, understanding of, uh, of, of what uh, the future could, could bring, and you know, this future but also, also depending on what other countries do, you know, including for gas prices and hydrogen prices, then you know, how can the modeling support decision, decision making? So it's really, I'm really looking at this as a sort of tool that can inform industries, where the scenarios in a way are provided by the experts. You know, we, we are not, we're not experts so, of this kind of analysis. You know, we're experts on sort of modeling and tool development. So that's, that's what uh, you know, we, are, we, would, we, we, would, we would do. I, I don't have clear answers at the moment because uh, we haven't really run, I mean, any scenario literally for, for Australia yet. If you ask me about the UK, I, I could say something a bit, a bit more, but at the moment really the idea is can we develop tools that we can give to industry so that all the discussions are a little bit less philosophical and more sort of en engineer based with, with numbers and all that. You could see, like, I mean, obviously, just from what you described here about changing excess demand or generation into gas, you could see it, like, you could almost see a business case over east where they do have a shortage of gas and prices are high. So you've all, you've almost got that demand there. You've got probably an excess of renewables, solar and wind that are looking to connect. So you, you kind of almost are forming that business case. And then if you can get all the value stack as well, you know, the fast frequency services and other things, then it sounds... We, absolutely. We, we, we see that, for example, in Paul Lincoln. That, but that is exactly the point. So, so the idea is you develop the tools that can really put the numbers on this, and then you say, okay, this actually works, it doesn't work, and all that. And certainly, in, in some conditions would work, in some others not. And it's really about identifying where it works under what conditions. There was a question there. Yeah, also. I was just wondering, with the planned integration, would it be more uh, leaning towards having um, electrolyzers operating continuously and having storage provided, yeah. or operating more on demand? Than um, again, this very much depends uh, uh, on, on, on specific conditions and the, the, the eventually the control strategy that you would like to have for electrolyzers. What other technologies would do in the system? Because there will always be sort of competition from other technologies. For example, batteries would be there doing something else. So effectively, what you would do with electrolyzers is at sort of system level would depend also on a number of, of, of sort of boundary, boundary conditions. It's not, uh, for what we've seen, there is no, no such a sort of clear thing as to what they should, they should do. It, it changes a lot. Because if you, if you are in a very constrained area, for example, uh, you can do some, some things. If you're not in a constrained area, you could do other things. Depending on how big you, is, is your storage, uh, many, many, many things. I don't think there is an easy answer to this. Any other questions? Looks like uh, we exhausted all the questions from um, Professor Perlegi. Um We just want to uh, thank you, Professor. You spending, uh, uh, you decided spending time with us, all the way from uh, Melbourne, and thank you for uh, taking our invitation. And uh, I'm sure you all enjoy it tonight. Uh, it's a very uh, deep uh, subject. I think he can talk a um, couple of days on that. And um, who would like him to come back again? <laughs> I'm sure everybody wanted you to come back again. Um, if you're interested in uh, any other uh, subject in, in this matter, uh, uh, IEEE to facilitate, I'm happy to uh, take that uh, note. My name is Roshan Fan, I'm, I'm chapter chair. Uh, please stay back and uh, talk to us. Otherwise, uh, click email to Michelle, uh, or if you are a triple member, of course, you will uh, uh, get our e-notice. Um, um, in that case, note, I would like to uh, uh, present a small uh, gift of uh, uh, you know, appreciation to our professor. Thank you. Thank you. It's a fuel cell. It's a fuel cell. I thought it was a fuel cell. Ah, I thought it was a fuel cell. Okay, that's true. And, uh, <laughs> And thank oh, you very much for tonight uh, coming and joining uh, and uh, enjoying this presentation with us. Um, until we see you again and, and have a pleasant night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.